All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Goreski, and I'll be your host for today. Those who are new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we are all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America uh, and beyond. So we've been broadcasting since uh, schools closed in March, three to four live events a day, probably 300 or so events uh, so far. And it's kind of uh, crazy to think the school year is wrapping up for many classes in Canada uh, and the US, but we still have a few more events, uh, including today's event with the Duke Lemur Center. So we're joining uh, Matt Borth today. He is a paleontologist who studies the evolution of animals in Africa, particularly the evolution of carnivorous mammals, including some of the oldest meat eaters uh, to chase down our primate ancestors. So he's the curator of the Lemur Center's Division of Fossil Primates. He oversees 30,000 plus specimens. It is one of the world's largest and most important collections of uh, early primates. So Matt, it's so exciting to have you joining us live today. We've got a great group of students joining us live on YouTube. So start introducing yourselves, let us know where you're tuning in from. And then we have another awesome group joining us live uh, in the Zoom call, and I bet they're going to have lots of questions for us today. So, hey, Matt, how are you? I'm doing really, really well. Thanks so much for letting me join you again. That's a really impressive number of uh, of visitors that you've hosted over the last couple of months, and I've, it's been an honor for the Lemur Center to be part of that, and it's been a lot of fun while we're shut down, too, uh, to really be able to bring so many students into both our living collection, hopping around in the forest with our lemurs, and also here to our fossil collection. And so um, today I'd like to introduce uh, everyone who's able to join us to some of the animals that are directly connected to the lemur center. That is this fossil record of lemurs themselves. And so here in the division of fossil primates, we work on kind of tracking fossils all over the world because primates have lived all over the world. But eventually lemurs get down to the island of Madagascar. And I know that if you've participated in other Exploring by the Sea or Pants programs, you might be familiar with this island, but in case you're not, this is a world map. Over here is North America, and I'm speaking to you from down here in the state of North Carolina, in the city of Durham, which is where Duke University is. To get to Madagascar, we have to go all the way south of the equator to the other side of Africa, to this island that's off the coast of Africa. And that island is the home of every lemur. Today, there are over 100 species of lemurs. So these are some pictures of lemurs that are actually part of the Duke Lemur Center. So there are lemurs that their relatives once lived in Madagascar, and now they live in this natural habitat that we have here in North Carolina, where we work in conserving these animals. We try to figure out these hyper endangered creatures um, are at risk. And so we wanna figure out both how to help them uh, survive into the future so that future generations of people can experience um, all of the joys of, of hanging out and uh, getting to live alongside lemurs. Um, we also do a lot of research with the lemurs. It's all called non-invasive research, which means that we don't actually uh, do anything to them. We're basically observing the animals. Sometimes we're collecting samples um, that they leave behind. Um, and sometimes we're studying how well they remember things, but uh, it's all non-invasive research, which lets us learn more about how lemurs actually behave so that when we go back to Madagascar, we can use that information to help save them um, as they're becoming very endangered. And one way that we can figure out how lemurs uh, are threatened and how they might've gone extinct is by looking at their fossil record. And so the fossil record is the record of life on earth. A fossil is basically just a object that used to be part of a living organism that then is preserved in rocks for sometimes millions of years, sometimes billions of years, and sometimes only a couple thousand years. So when we look at the fossil record of Madagascar, what we might hope is that this island has rocks that preserve fossils from the whole time that lemurs have been there. Unfortunately, that's not the case. <laughs> Up here, this band across the top of this poster, that kind of moving color at the top there, that is what's called a geological timeline. And the geological timeline is basically the way geologists organize the history of life on Earth. And those different time periods get different names. And so the time of the age of reptiles is the Mesozoic era. 
The Mesozoic is famous for having creatures like dinosaurs, non-avian dinosaurs. The very end of the age of dinosaurs had creatures in North America like Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops. But then 66 million years ago, those animals went extinct. And then we begin what's called the Cenozoic era. The Cenozoic is sometimes called the age of mammals. And that is the time period when we're looking for primates and lemurs, which are uh, relatives of monkeys and apes that live in Madagascar. So the problem is that we don't have fossils from Madagascar of life on land for most of the age of mammals. Most of what we know about the fossil record of Madagascar comes from the very end of the Cenozoic. It's actually very close to our time period. We don't start getting fossils of animals like lemurs in Madagascar until a couple of thousand years ago. And a couple of thousand years ago is a long time ago. Um, but in the grand scheme of Earth history, it's not that long ago. So a lot of the fossils that we find in Madagascar are basically from the time period uh, and tell us a lot about the ecosystem that was in Madagascar really, really recently. So I'm gonna introduce you to some of these animals that only went extinct a couple thousand years ago because Madagascar had some giant lemurs that once lived on the island. This is the skull of an animal called Megalatopus. Megalatopus, I'm gonna show you what that name looks like because in paleontology, we have lots of names that have really a lot of syllables in them. So Megalatopus means mega is giant and adipus means lemur-like primate. So it means the giant lemur-like primate. And this giant lemur-like primate right here was about the size of a gorilla. This is the skull of a gorilla, which is the largest primate that's alive today. That gorilla is basically the size of Megalatopus. And I saw someone who, who asked if this was Smilodon, because you might've seen this big sharp tooth up here in the front of its face. That big sharp tooth is actually, uh, a, just like Smilodon, which has a big long sharp tooth, um, is a tooth that uh, actually in, in Megalatopus, it's not a canine, it's called a premolar, which is the same tooth that a lot of animals use for smashing up food, but instead in, in lemurs, it becomes a big pointy tooth. And lots of lemurs actually have big long teeth in the front of their face. So this is the skull of a modern lemur. It's called a ruffed lemur. Ruffed lemurs are called that because they look like they have a big beard that goes all the way around their face. And so they have these flat teeth at the back of their head that they use for smashing up fruit. Ruffed lemurs love to eat fruit. They eat so much sometimes that falls out of their mouths as they're trying to eat. They're really messy eaters. But in the front, they have this big pointy tooth. And so big pointy teeth sometimes are used by carnivores to slice through meat. But other animals, especially animals that are really social, will have long front teeth that they use for flashing at each other for social display. So kind of like how we smile, we basically, smiling is a way for us to signal to each other like, hey, I'm doing okay, how are you doing? We're all safe here. Um, and when we smile, we actually show our teeth. And so our teeth are part of how we communicate with each other. Lemurs do the exact same thing. And so Megalatopus would have had these teeth in the front of its face that probably would have used to communicate with other lemurs that would have been around at the time. So Megalatopus is this giant gorilla-sized lemur and what's amazing about Megalatopus is Megalatopus only went extinct about 700 years ago. So 700 years ago, that's a time period that is historical, like 1300 BCE. That's a time period when in China, the Great Wall of China is being kind of connected into the giant wall that it is today. In Europe, there was a big plague called the Black Death. And um, on the island of Madagascar, there was a giant gorilla-sized lemur that was almost about to go extinct. So that's really not that long ago we had this giant on the island. It was joined by another giant, an animal called Archaeoindri. Archaeoindri was another gorilla-sized lemur that lived in the middle part of Madagascar. We don't have very, very many fossils of this creature, but Archaeoindri, as you can see from this picture, had really long front legs and really short back legs. That body plan is something that we don't find in any lemur that's alive today. Most lemurs have basically their front legs and their back legs are pretty much close to the same size. So other lemurs 
have really long back legs. This is the skeleton of a lemur called a shafak. And if you tuned in last week for the lemur center stream, you would have seen a lot of these shafaks that were hopping around the forest at the lemur center. They have such long back legs and such short front legs that they can't walk on all fours. They actually have to hop on their back legs. Their proportions are actually a lot like a human's. This is the skeleton of a shafak. And you can see these relatively short limbs. So here's like the front leg and here's its upper arm bone compared to its back leg its upper arm bone is way, way shorter than its back leg. So this animal can jump really, really powerfully. But there were these lemurs that lived on the island of Madagascar that had these really, really long front legs and short back legs. Those included archaeoindry, which is big. It's the size of a brown bear or a gorilla, if that helps. Um, and then there was a relative of archaeoindry that also lived in the forest of Madagascar that we have a complete skeleton of here at the Lemur Center. And so if you'll follow me out of the collection um, where we store all of these fossils so researchers can find these things, I wanna introduce you to an animal called Paleopropithecus. Paleopropithecus has a body plan that doesn't look anything like any lemur that has been uh, discovered that lives today. Um, this is a lemur whose nickname is the sloth lemur. And it's called a sloth lemur because much like the sloths of South America, this is an animal that was built for hanging underneath branches and probably slowly and very carefully walking along those branches, eating leaves and probably fruit. So when you look at the head of this animal, you can see again, it has this lemur-like big sharp tooth at the front of its face. It has these big round eyes. They almost look like goggles on its head. And part of how we know that this animal probably would have lived a lot like a sloth is it has these super long limbs. Its hands have basically become hooks that it would have used as super, super deep muscle scars that show it had a really powerful grip that it kind of would have used to hook its hands over branches. Its wrists and elbows would have been really, really mobile. So it could have rotated its hands and its hips really far out. So this is the hip bone of Paleopropithecus. It's almost like an ice cream cone. This is the, your hip joint. For us, our hip joint is pretty much limited to going back and forth. The way that the hip bone of Paleopropithecus is built, it could almost swivel all the way around. This is an animal that could have put its foot basically anywhere it wanted to as it was crawling through the, through the forest. It didn't have a tail, as far as we can tell. We've never found any tail bones from this animal. And all along its back bones, Normally on the back of a lemur, you would have big chunks of bone sticking down below its ribs. That's where muscles attach that help animals like you and me keep our backs straight. So if you lean back, what you're doing is you're using the muscles that help you keep a good posture, that helps you stand up. And if you look at an animal like a dog or a cat, they flex their backs when they run. It's really important for keeping their spine up straight. But in Paleopropithecus, they basically didn't have the bones those muscles attached to, which is a clue to paleontologists that this is the posture. Instead of flexing their back backwards, Paleopropithecus would have been more comfortable with its back in this kind of hammock shape that would have let it kind of conserve a lot of energy as it moves through the forests of Madagascar. And this is another animal that we think only went extinct maybe 700 years ago. There's actually an idea that Paleopropithecus went extinct only a few centuries ago because there are, there are stories in Madagascar of an animal called the tray tray tray. And tray 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 uh, was an animal that had a short face, it had long claws, it was the size of a child, um, and it lived in the forest. And so what paleontologists think is that the tray 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 uh, is basically a remembrance. So the people of Madagascar remember encountering Paleopropithecus in the forests of Madagascar. And one of the things that, that happens a lot in the names of lemurs that live in Madagascar is a lot of the people who live in Madagascar, who are the, called the Malagasy people, uh, they tend to name lemurs after the sounds they make. So shafox, the hopping lemurs that jump around on their back legs are called shafox because they make a sound that sounds like shafok. And so we think that tray 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 is some kind of imitation of what the Paleopropithecus might have sounded like. And so it's one of the only cases where we have an extinct animal 
where we have a hypothesis of what that animal might have sounded like when it was alive. So I've introduced you to Megalatopus, I've introduced you to Archaeolemur, and I've introduced you to Paleoprohypicus. Does anyone have any questions about those creatures so far? All right, so we are gonna take a few little pauses uh, as Matt shows us uh, some of the fossils and talks a little bit about uh, the work that he does. So those who are tuning in live to the call, you can raise uh, your blue hand in the call and I can pick you that way. Those who are tuning in live via YouTube can go ahead and send in a couple of questions there as well. And so we'll take a little pause here. We'll take a few questions and then we'll let Matt continue for a little bit. So Trent, Trent, I can see your hand is up already. If you want to unmute for me, Trent. Um, if the tray, tray, tray was still alive, do you think it would make other animals go extinct in Madagascar? That's a really important question about Madagascar, is we have so many animals that have gone extinct, we really have to wonder what impact their extinction or their survival would have had on other lemurs. And one of the things that we know from studying the head of Paleoprohypicus is this is an animal that has very flat teeth, just like Megalatopus. So this is probably a plant eater. And so the main things that would have been uh, threatened by Paleoprohypicus would have been the plants that it would have lived with. So things like trees and fruit that it would have eaten. Um, one of the things that's really amazing about the subfossil record of Madagascar is that it's important to remember that Paleoprohypicus and Megalatopus lived so recently that they lived next to uh, the animals that we still have in Madagascar. So I'm gonna open some drawers here. Um, so these are some of our other fossil collections and some of these aren't very pretty. So when you go to a natural history museum, you tend to see a lot of specimens that look like this, that are kind of a beautiful skull or they look like that Shafak skeleton that's all beautifully mounted. But all of this stuff is also really important data for scientists to use to understand the past. And one of the things that we have in this collection right here is the skull of a modern uh, mongoose lemur. So this animal uh, is still alive today. We actually have some of these at the Duke Lemur Center. This skull is just as old as this skull. And so it would have lived alongside, so a living animal would have shared the same ecosystem with Megalatopus. In fact, when we look at some subfossil sites, places where we find these very recent fossils from Madagascar, um, we actually find more diversity of lemurs in those sites than we have today. Um, there's a site uh, in the middle of Madagascar where we have 18 different species of lemurs that are living all next to each other. Uh, that is more than the diversity of lemurs we find in any other place today in Madagascar. So it's clear that these giant animals would have been able to live alongside modern lemurs and they really didn't have much of an impact. They didn't cause these animals to go extinct. Um, instead, what seems to be happening is um, as these animals go extinct, nothing is replacing them. Um, and so Madagascar has lost basically all animals that weigh more than 22 pounds. Um, and everything less than 22 pounds seems to be surviving, but it's very endangered um, as the ecosystems of Madagascar change. Thank you for your question. All right, I'm going to grab one on YouTube here. Um... Zoe would like to know about predators of lemurs and how do you think something like the tray 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 or the giant uh, lemurs you showed us, how did you, do you think they became extinct? So um, one of the big predators that we still have in Madagascar today is an animal called a fusa. Fusas are, they look a little bit like cats. This is the skull of a fusa. This is a subfossil skull. So this one is a couple centuries old, um, but there's modern fusas that live there today. Um, fusas genetically are most closely related to mongooses, things like meerkats. Um, but once this group of animals got to Madagascar, they became really, really good predators. And the way we know that is again, teeth. Teeth are a really, really good clue to what a animal was doing uh, when it was alive because teeth are basically how an animal eats. It also tells you how big an animal was. If you find just a single tooth, it can tell you a lot of information. It can tell you how big it was. It can tell you about its relationships because uh, lineages of animals inherit 
the genetic architecture that leads to the structure of these teeth. And right here, this big tooth is a slicing tooth called a carnassial. And a carnassial is basically a knife blade that's inside the mouths of lots of hunting animals. And so uh, the FUSA today hunts, hunts lemurs. It's a, it's a big threat to lemurs. Um, in the subfossil record, one of the animals that went extinct that weighed more than 22 pounds was what's called the giant cave FUSA. And the giant cave FUSA, if this is the skull of the FUSA, would have been about one and a half times longer. So their skulls come out to about here. And so they're even bigger than modern FUSAs. And so the cave FUSA, which is a different species of FUSA, um, was probably a predator that hunted these really, really big lemurs that lived in Madagascar, because FUSAs still do. Um, if you have the chance to see a FUSA at a zoo um, or watch videos of them online, they are amazing to watch climb. Lemurs are, uh, as primates, really, really good at scampering through the trees. And if you want to hunt a lemur, you have to be a better climber than a lemur. And so fusas are just incredible acrobats in the trees. They're, their ankle can actually flip backwards so that they can scramble down tree trunks really easily, like a squirrel. That's a really rare thing to find in mammals. And so um, the cave fusa is probably one of the predators of these big things. Another animal that went extinct in Madagascar that was giant is an animal called the Malagasy crowned eagle. And the crowned eagle would have been a giant eagle that uh, lived in Madagascar. Um, that probably hunted uh, primates. There's crowned eagles that still live in Africa. And those are also really, really big birds. And there's evidence of crowned eagles hunting primates. People have seen them hunting primates in mainland Africa. And there's actually evidence from the human fossil record of people being attacked by these giant uh, birds from above. So it's a really scary predator um, because they can kind of come out of nowhere. Um, and there was a giant uh, eagle that is also extinct that once lived in Madagascar that was probably also hunting these giant lemurs. Um, and while we're on the theme of giant birds that lived in Madagascar, on the ground there was another giant bird. This is an animal called an elephant bird. The elephant bird is the largest bird that has ever walked the planet. Um, and that means it didn't fly. So this is a picture by an artist that shows basically it's long like big dinosaur-like back legs. And it doesn't really have wings. Its muscles that would have attached to its wings would, were really, really small. And the genus for the elephant bird, so the, the equivalent of something like Megalatopus, is Apiornis. And Apiornis means without wings. So A means missing or doesn't have it. And then uh, uh, Ap means wings. So it's a bird that didn't have wings. Um, and this is the egg of the elephant bird compared to the egg of a chicken. The egg of the elephant bird could hold two gallons of yolk. It is the largest egg that has ever been discovered. Uh, yesterday, a team of researchers announced a new egg <clears throat> from the time of the dinosaurs. And that egg is just barely the size of the elephant bird egg. So this is still kind of the reigning champion of eggs that have ever been laid and ever been discovered. And what's really amazing about that is the elephant bird is a bird and birds are living dinosaurs. Dinosaurs didn't go entirely extinct at the end of the age of dinosaurs. Instead, one lineage managed to survive 66 million years ago and that's the lineage that gave rise to, to birds. And so this is actually a giant dinosaur that lived on the island of Madagascar that only went extinct maybe 700 years ago and it laid these giant eggs that are bigger than any dinosaur egg that's been discovered so far. So this is the biggest dinosaur egg. It's the biggest bird egg. And one of the things that's amazing about an egg is an egg is just one cell. It starts out as a single cell and then grows as the cells multiply. And so this, the egg of the elephant bird, is the largest cell that has ever been discovered. And it comes from the island of Madagascar. Very cool, Matt. I've heard in certain places you can walk around and still find those shell fragments and even piece yes. one together. Exactly. Yeah. You can, people make jewelry out of them because it's almost like pottery um, and people store liquids in them um, to walk around. They're basically canteens. It's really incredible. They are all over the island, which tells us that the elephant birds were living all over the island and they were a really important part of their ecosystem. And um, I think the second part of the question um, was why these things went extinct. Um, and that 
is a really big and really important question. Um, that's basically one of the one of the things paleontologists are trying to figure out. Like, why do we study these amazing animals? One reason is because it is really, really cool to learn what was possible in the past and to learn what kinds of like, I wouldn't have imagined a gorilla-sized lemur was ever possible, but then the fossil record reveals that there's creatures like that. Um, the other reason we study fossils is because we're really interested in extinction. We know that animals and plants are not with us anymore. And we want to understand why that happened and what impact that can have on the modern world. And so the hypothesis for why these animals went extinct is they um, were living on the island for thousands, maybe millions of years. Like I said, the fossil record of Madagascar only goes back maybe 12,000. Sometimes tw there's a couple sites that are like 28,000 years old. That's like nothing. That's like back to basically the last ice age. Um, which in the grand scheme of Earth history is not very far back. Um, but what we know is that humans arrived in Madagascar sometime between 8,000 and 10,000 years ago. Um, and we know for sure that a lot of people showed up um, about 2,000 years ago. And so those dates, like 8,000, 2,000, those are all before 1,000 to 700 years ago when these animals all went extinct. So somehow people were living alongside these giants for a really long time. But then something happened. A couple centuries ago, uh, these animals start to go extinct. And the hypothesis for what caused that to happen is that's around the time that people living in Madagascar started to adopt agriculture and really started to use uh, rice as a way to make a living. And if you want to learn a little bit more about how important rice is to the culture of Madagascar, um, you should check out Carrie Whitman's presentation that she did uh, two weeks ago. Uh, she's a fossil reparator, she's a paleontologist, but she also studies rice in Madagascar because it's really, really important to the culture. And rice takes up a lot of space. And one of the things you need uh, for rice is cows to help you uh, till your fields and make your fields fertile so you can grow food for your family. And so one hypothesis is that a lot of these animals went extinct, not because people were hunting them, which is what a lot of people thought at the beginning. It's like big animals, they're dead because people were hunting them for meat. People were hunting them. There's evidence of butchering giant lemurs um, from the archeological record of Madagascar. But the animals didn't go extinct with what the hunting was going on. Instead, there's this change. And as agriculture starts to take off, people need to make fertile fields. One way to do that is by basically cutting into the forest. If you burn lots of vegetation, if you burn things like trees, that helps put more nutrients into the ground and you can grow even more food for your family. As you cut into the forest and chop things down, you start to carve up the landscape. These big animals need lots of land to range over. And so what we think happened is as the population of Madagascar grew and as uh, agriculture became more important, it started to chop up the forests and that caused these animals to kind of get isolated in smaller and smaller places. And eventually they went extinct um, because humans started changing the landscape. Um, and that's something that's still happening in Madagascar. There's an animal today that lives in Madagascar called the Indri. And this is the skull of an Indri. Um, Indris are closely related to Shafox. Um, they don't do very well in captivity though. So it's really important to conserve these animals in Madagascar. These are among the most endangered lemurs that are in Madagascar today. And they live in a really small spot of the island. Indris are threatened partially because they live in a part of Madagascar where it's also really good to grow rice. And so the same extinction pressures that likely led to the extinction of something like Megalatopus or the extinction of another giant lemur, this is Archaeolemur, which is a, it's called the monkey lemur because it would have been a big, it's like a golden retriever sized lemur that had a big brain and teeth that were built for smashing really hard objects. Things like um, tubers and um, other kinds of plants would have been really important for this animal. It has square teeth that actually look more like us or more like a monkey than it looks like a lemur. Um, this animal also would have uh, gone extinct, triggered by a lot of the extinction pressures that are still threatening animals like the injury today in Madagascar. All right, Matt. Well, our time is flying. So I thought I'd check in with you and see if there was something else you really wanted to show us. And then I think we should uh, move into more Q&A because there's lots yeah. of questions coming in. I think one thing that I want to show you real quick is before I leave off on the story of extinction, um, it's really easy to kind of think of humans as the bad guys in all of this. 
um, because humans uh, living in Madagascar are causing a lot of the extinction pressures that um, are pushing lemurs to the brink. Um, but people aren't doing that because they're mean. They're not doing that because they don't like lemurs. They're doing that because they're trying to make food for their families. And that's a really important thing. We all want to keep our families safe. And in some ways, humans, because we are really smart primates, to be honest, we are way smarter than lemurs. We can use what we've learned about the past to try to figure out how humans and lemurs can coexist and help encourage these things come, to come back. And in some ways, humans have a really important role to play in that ecosystem. So I wanna show you actually one of my favorite objects that we have in our collection. This is a thing called the trample burr. It looks a little bit, honestly, it looks a little bit like a coronavirus that's kind of blown up. Um, this is me holding a 3D print, it's super delicate. This is a plant, um, there, this is a seed pod from a plant that grows in Madagascar. It's also called a mousetrap plant because people will take dried uh, versions of this that have hooks on the end of them and put them in the corners of their houses to keep mice from coming into the house. The mousetrap plant or the trample burr um, is too big for anything that lives in Madagascar today to carry around. But this is a plant that's clearly adapted for hooking onto things like, uh, like elephant birds or megalatopus or paleopropithecus to then carry the seed to other parts of the forest because plants can't move. The only way plants can go out to new places is if their seeds get moved from one place to another. So this plant without giant animals like elephant birds and megalatopus carrying it around might go extinct. And it's a really important part of its ecosystem, but it's not. It's not going extinct. And why is that? It's because humans are big animals and we bring big animals with us. Things like cows and goats, those animals are big enough to carry the seed around. And so this seed is now depending on humans to help keep it alive. And so that's part of the reason why humans can actually be part of the conservation equation. If we understand what is threatened and what's changing the ecosystem, we can then learn from that and see that humans actually need to be included in how we preserve places in Madagascar. If we just get rid of humans, if we say no more humans can live here, like get out, it's only for the lemurs, it means that things like the trample burr and the mousetrap plant will go extinct because they need things like us to help move it around now that the big animals are gone. All right. So that, I'd really love to hear some questions. I, I know we are winding down. <laughs> That's okay. It's, I mean, it really just shows some of the amazing, um, you know, things you have, and we barely scratch the surface. You've got over 30,000 uh, <laughs> fossils lot. that tell this incredible <laughs> story and we barely scratched the surface and saw some pretty amazing things. So I can only imagine uh, what other treasures uh, that you house there. All right, Keswick, Ontario. We have some great six sevens joining us online uh, with Mrs. Dion. If you wanna turn your microphone on, uh, we'll grab a question. Hi, I have a question from Gracie. And Gracie wanted to know if the um, animal fossils you found on Madagascar are present in any other parts of the world. One of the things that's really amazing about Madagascar is that there are most of the species that live there are only found in Madagascar. Uh, lemurs, for instance, are only found on the island. So megalatopus is an animal, that, or archaeolemur. Um, or this giant pygmy hippopotamus that once lived in Madagascar. This is a species that was unique to the island. But honestly, this hippo, uh, its relatives live in mainland Africa. So instead of um, finding fossils of animals in Madagascar that we also find in other parts of the world, we do find their relatives. And so this is a hippo that would have been about the size of a pig. Um, and this is another animal that we know um, Malagasy people actually met. Um, there are stories of an animal called a suumbi, which means the cow that's not a cow. Um, and it's described as wallowing in the water and being really grumpy about people getting close to it um, and trying to get into its river, which is something that hippos do today. Um, so there are hippos that got from mainland Africa to Madagascar. And we, because these hippos aren't all that different from mainland African hippos, we think these animals arrived more recently than the lemurs did. Uh, lemurs arrived uh, sometime between about like 50 million years ago and 30 million years ago. So they've had a long time as primates to live by themselves and kind of become this incredible radiation of animals. Um, of course, there's other animals that live in Madagascar. Um, there's animals like Tenrex. I'm going to show you another drawer. Tenrex are these animals that their heads look a little bit like a bottle rocket. 
um, they have really small brains um, and they also have these big long canines and long snouts. They are animals that are also basically only found in Madagascar. Uh, much like lemurs, they like one of the one or two early tenrex got there from Africa, um, and then they just went nuts and filled in all kinds of uh, small-bodied animal uh, niches. And so tenrex, there are tenrex. There's one basically that lives in mainland Africa today. It's called the um, the otter tenrex or the water tenrex. And so that's evidence that a lot of the animals we find in the fossil record of Madagascar are animals that came from Africa to Madagascar. What's really crazy about that is Madagascar has been an island off the coast of Africa for a really, really long time. This chunk of water from the Mozambique Channel has been there uh, since the end of the, since like before the end of the age of dinosaurs. And so um, anything that gets there had to come from somewhere else. And so once it gets there, not a lot of things are able to make it. And so they then radiate and we get unique species. So we find relatives of things in Madagascar in mainland Africa. But in Madagascar, most of the species that we find there are totally unique to the island. Okay, very cool. So Colton, Colton's joining us from Oakville, Ontario. Colton, do you wanna put your mic on? Um, I'm gonna, Colton's shy, so I'm gonna talk for him. He's Great. wondering about the theory that there was a large um, lemur that a long time ago moved across the land bridge into North America, and that's what we see as Bigfoot. Oh, yes. So there are lots of hypotheses about where the story of Bigfoot came from. Um, because having a giant primate living in North America would be really, really cool. Um, so that theory um, probably doesn't really make a lot, doesn't really hold up when we look at the geological record. Um, Madagascar has been an island for a really long time. And one of the things we know is that animals that can cross bodies of water tend to be really small. That's because the only way you can do this is by rafting. Basically, uh, they don't build rafts, um, but instead they use natural rafts. Um, there's some really incredible video from the Amazon, which is this big river that's in South America, where plants kind of growing along the mouth of the Amazon um, form out into the, into the water. And then during a hurricane, or some big tidal surge, those plants get ripped out and they basically become a natural island that kind of floats out into the Atlantic Ocean. And people have found primates, they found rodents, they found animals kind of floating in the middle of oceans on these rafts. And that's also been observed in the Indian Ocean. So we think that the way that animals got from Africa to Madagascar is by floating on these natural rafts that would have come out of the river mouths of all of the countries that are kind of along the east coast of Africa. And the problem is if you're a big animal, you can't be stuck on an island for very long floating in the middle of the ocean because big animals need a lot of water and they need a lot of food. And so it's really hard once you get past a certain body size to survive on a raft if you're not a human because we can think ahead and we can pack things like water and food. Um, if you're not a human or you're not an animal and ship, um, it's going to be really hard to get enough food to get you across. So a big animal like Bigfoot um, would have probably not done very well on one of these natural rafts. Um, in fact, we think that uh, the stories of Bigfoot probably, uh, we don't have a fossil record of giant apes living in North America uh, very recently. Um, there were primates that lived in North America, but they all went extinct about like 33, 34 million years ago. Um, and then, as far as we know, the next primates to arrive in North America after the extinction of these small kind of lemur-like primates that used to live in North America are us. And so we are kind of like the first primates in North America, if you live in North America, um, that have been here in a really long time. Um, so we haven't found any fossil evidence of any other giant ape living in North America. So we're not sure that Bigfoot is something that's actually living in the woods. Um, but you know, people are still looking. So maybe they'll find more evidence someday. All right. Mrs. Erickson is joining us. She's representing Stafford Springs, uh, Connecticut. If you want to unmute Mrs. Erickson. Yes, Patrick, if you can unmute your mic and ask your question. What is your biggest fossil like in your museum? The biggest fossil in our museum that's a very interesting question because we have a fossil can be just like a piece of a much bigger animal. Um, 
So I think we have some fossils that are from Africa of elephants that lived 25 million years ago, or maybe like 23 million years ago. Um, this is the jawbone of a mastodon-like elephant. Um, so this is where the chewing muscles would have attached. This is the front of its face. This animal would have looked something like this or like this. Um, they would have been like a, a rhinoceros-sized elephant um, that then gave rise to uh, things like mastodons. And mastodons eventually made it to North America. Um, so that's a really big fossil we have. We also have the tooth of a woolly mammoth, which is an animal that would have been alive at the same time as Megalodipus in Madagascar. So this is a ice age animal that lived in North America. This is a chewing surface. This is the size of one tooth. And so this isn't the biggest fossil necessarily, but like it's part of a much, much bigger animal. Um, and then finally we have some giant skulls of some creatures that lived in North America. This one's from about 60 million years ago. What you're looking at is it's basically resting on the top of its skull. Its eye would have gone here. This is the roof of its mouth. These are its chewing teeth and the back of its head and then its snout is this way. And this is where its spinal cord would have gone in the back of its brain. It's an animal called Corypidon. Corypidon is actually the biggest mammal ever up to its time. Mammals during the age of dinosaurs didn't really get much bigger than like a beaver. But this animal, after the extinction of the dinosaurs, demonstrated that it was possible for the mammal body plan to become something that became gigantic. So animals like Megalatopus and animals like uh, Paleocropithecus kind of owe a debt of gratitude to Corypidon for kind of plowing ahead and figuring out how to be a big plant eating animal um, on planet earth because before Corypidon, there really wasn't such a thing. So that's probably one of our biggest animals. And it's also one of our oldest things in the collection, which is kind of cool. Very cool. So Alyssa on YouTube, she would like to know, you know, we, we saw some of those fossils and then you showed some of those artist pictures. Um, how do the artists kind of take the fossil and then make it into one of those pictures? That is um, a really, really exciting part of the science of paleontology in some ways, because when you have to actually, like as a paleontologist, one of the things that I do is I study the bones and I make hypotheses. I say, Nick, it's possible that the foot went in this direction, like in Megalatopus, for instance, Megalatopus has a huge, huge foot. Its foot is longer than the rest of its leg. So if you add up its thigh bone plus its shin bone, that is shorter than just its foot. And so there's no animal alive <laughs> that has a big kind of foot like that. Um, and so trying to figure out from what we can tell in the muscles of Megalatopus, that big foot was used for really powerfully gripping onto really wide tree trunks and branches. Um, but then like, if you talk to a paleo artist, um, you have to actually figure out like how flexible was that foot? How would it actually be positioned? And so this is a picture um, that was drawn by Carrie, who again was the fossil preparator who was here two weeks ago. Um, and she works in the collection and works on these fossils. She's also a really amazing artist. And she did this picture of Paleocropithecus and this picture of Megalatopus. And we had a long conversation where I actually got out the bones of the foot of Megalatopus to try to figure out like how much this ankle could flex. And so we went back and forth. And so in some ways, these pictures that you see paleontologists present when they show these animals are the result of a really long scientific conversation where the artist will ask the paleontologist questions and things that paleontologist hasn't thought about. So things like what color should this animal be? Um, as a paleontologist looking at bones, I don't, I don't know what color they were, but um, we wanna make a picture of it. So then we figure out what kind of evidence do we have to make our best guess about what these animals might've looked like. And so then we look at the close relatives of Megalatopus that are alive today. And so those are things like ringtail lemurs and things like um, the mongoose lemur. Um, a lot of those animals tend to be kind of brownish. They have whitish tummies. And so we made the stomach of Megalatopus white and we made the back of it kind of brownish. Uh, lemurs tend to have these kind of tufts of hair around their ears. And so we added that in and kind of, we don't know, but we gave it this little bald spot, just kind of make it a little different. What we do know from the fossil is it had this little pig snout. Um, they had a mobile nose because we have on the face of Megalatopus, this bone that's like overhanging the nose. In a lemur, you don't have that bone, their nose, the hole for the nose kind of sticks out and then the teeth are here. Megalatopus had some kind of snout 
that probably could have moved around a lot, like a kind of a mini trunk that would have helped it probably grab leaves um, as it was climbing through the forest. And so I'm actually trying to figure out how much of a trunk to put on Megalatopus was something that Carrie and I had to decide as we were putting this picture together that we're gonna use to teach people about Megalatopus biology. So the answer is it's lots, it's a long conversation, it's lots of data, um, and it's both science and art combined, which is a really exciting part of the process and something Carrie is really gifted at. All right, so we're gonna have time to take a couple more questions. So anyone in the Zoom call, if you wanna raise your hand virtually, but for now, uh, Ms. Dion, if you want to turn your mic on with another question from your students. Yeah, we have a question for you, Matt. Um, we have a question about what made you want to be a paleontologist and what route you had to take. Um, and that is from Ethan. Yeah, that's, that's a really important uh, question to always ask. When there's someone who has a really weird job that you haven't heard of before, um, try to figure out how they got there. Because I, I'll be honest, it's I didn't become a scientist and I didn't become a paleontologist because I'm very smart. <laughs> um, I was a very average student. Um, what I was interested in is kind of where things come from. I was a very curious person um, and I asked lots of questions. Um, as many of, of the people listening, I'm sure you asked lots and lots of questions about the people around you. Um, and that's really, being a scientist. Um, being a scientist is basically wondering how the world got put together the way that it is. Um, so I was always interested in science because I was interested in how the world was put together. Um, the problem was that when I was younger, um, I thought that basically all the fossils had been discovered. Um, I saw lots of documentaries about dinosaurs and documentaries about woolly mammoths. And I saw lots of video of paleontologists talking about things like mammoths and I actually saw a video of paleontologists studying things like megalatopus. So a lot of these fossils were discovered um, by teams from the Duke Lemur Center um, and by researchers like Lori Godfrey, who's at uh, the University of Massachusetts, um, along with Malagasy scientists who are working on the island of Madagascar, who also are working to understand uh, the ecosystem of their nation. And so I would see these scientists and they seemed so confident and they knew a lot about these animals. And so I thought all the fossils had been discovered, honestly. I thought that there was no job, no future for paleontology. I could be excited about it, but it wasn't actually a job. And it wasn't until I went to university. Um, the part of the reason it's important to go to university or college for some people is because at university you discover jobs you didn't even know existed because there are so many more people. Your community gets much larger when you go to a university. And so it was at university that I saw a class listed called the History of Life. And I was, I had always been interested in fossils, but I was also interested in things like, like uh, international relations. I was interested in languages. Um, and so I kind of took it because I was like, oh, this is something I liked when I was younger. It was taught by a paleontologist. And that paleontologist, uh, she was still discovering things. She was still a scientist. And she talked a lot about the research she was doing. And it became very clear that we hadn't found all the fossils. And we hadn't even answered all the questions about the fossils that had been discovered. Behind me are thousands of specimens. And some of them have only been studied once or twice. Some of them haven't been studied at all. Uh, so museums are filled with future projects. And so in that course, I discovered that paleontology is a field that still needs help. And that's true of basically every branch of science. Science is, uh, has more questions than it has answers. But we can only talk about the answers. Like when we discover something new, scientists come out and say, here's what we discovered. It's harder for us to say, here's all the stuff we need help with. Um, and so it wasn't until I was at university, I realized how much help was needed in paleontology and that I wanted to join the team that would answer some of the questions about the past. Um, but that's true of whatever interest you have, there's still more work to be done. Um, so going to university and then you need a little bit more school after uh, getting your bachelor's degree. So I then got my doctorate degree which is basically a way to learn how to do research. It's how do you pose and then answer a question that doesn't have an answer yet. Um, and that's the process of getting a PhD. Um, and so after a couple of years uh, at the university um, on Long Island called Stony Brook University, um, I was then kind of got my certification as a researcher um, and then could start doing work both at museums and in universities, uh, learning more things about the past. All right, very cool. And I love those points that you brought up, Matt. Uh, that there's so much left for us to explore and discover. I think kids definitely think that. They look at TV shows, they look at scientists and think we figured everything out. There's nothing left for us to figure out, but that couldn't be further from the truth as you yeah. just shared with us. 
And this is a great resource, honestly. <laughs> the Exploring by Sea Your Pants is a really amazing way to learn about all of these jobs um, that are out there and all the answers that we need to discover yet. All right, Ms. Erickson, if you wanna turn your mic on, let's turn another one of your students loose. Hey, Jordan, you can ask one of your questions. Please unmute your mic. How small is your smallest fossil and how tall and heavy? Fossil. We have fossils of bats that are tiny. Um, so one of the things that I should say about where a lot of these fossils from Madagascar come from is from, let's see, where are my bats? Here we go. Um, a lot of these were found in caves. And so in those caves, we find giant lemurs that got washed in or maybe dragged in by predators. But of course, in caves, there's also animals that live there on their own. And so those animals are things like bats. And so this is the skull of a bat that's from Madagascar. Um, I'll get it out. It is a tiny, tiny, its skull is like paper thin. And so this is its skull. Its eyeballs would have gone here on the side. It has these big muscles for big chewing muscles. And it has tiny, sharp teeth that it would use for eating bugs. Its jaw is even smaller. So there's a tiny, tiny jaw of a bat. And what's even smaller than the skull and the jaw of a bat are things like its ankle bones and its finger bones. And so those are also collected. The way that this site in particular, where a lot of this stuff comes from, um, is a cave that had like 150 meter drop into it as a chimney, basically, where re the paleontologists would repel down into the cave and fill up buckets of sediment. Um, and then send the buckets back up to researchers at the top who would sort it all out. And they had microscopes that they would use for looking at these tiny, tiny fossils. Um, there's also tiny lemurs that we have from these sites. And so um, just like I showed you the skull of a modern lemur um, that, uh, of the, the um, mongoose lemur, we also have tiny jaws of animals like mouse lemurs. And actually, I'm gonna show you the, the skull of a modern mouse lemur. This is the smallest primate that we know of. It's alive in Madagascar today. It's almost as small as that little bat was. And we have subfossils of this creature um, that are also known from these cave sites. So there's some really tiny, tiny specimens that we have. And they only would have weighed a couple of ounces, um, which is a really amazing thing. We find them basically by scooping up material and then putting it through a screen and then using a microscope to look at the tiny, tiny evidence of the past. All right. Well, Matt, one thing I'm going to do after our call ends today, because I know there's lots of questions out there. Um, we've been having a great time doing these live events with Duke Lemur Center. We've had a couple with you now. We've talked to a few of the, the scientists who get out in the field in Madagascar as well, studying like James and Laura, who work with the people and with the lemurs in the field and the conservation. We had a great event uh, a couple weeks ago, live with the lemurs. Uh, out. So I'm pulling together a playlist right now. So those who are tuning in right oh, now, great. if you check the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants uh, YouTube channel in about, say, five to 10 minutes from now, I'm going to have a playlist of more events from Duke Lemur. So you can dig a little bit deeper. You can check out uh, some of the conservation work in the field right now. You can check out some of the lemurs at the center. Uh, you can check out Matt's last presentation. And then Matt, um, I'm also going to, any of the teachers who are tuning in now, whether on YouTube or on camera, if you send me more questions for Matt, I can forward a few more questions uh, for Matt. And if he has some time, uh, he can answer a few of those questions and I will send those back. Yeah, so, I would love to. Perfect. Excellent. Well, a huge shout out to all the groups who joined us live on YouTube today. Thanks for sending us in some great questions. Great to see so many educators um, and students joining us live in the Zoom call today. Thanks for hanging out with us. And Matt, it's always great to steal a little bit of your time. Uh, you're incredibly knowledgeable. You have an amazing wealth uh, of fossils at your hand. That's pretty darn cool. And uh, thank you so much for getting a presentation ready and sharing some of that excitement and passion with the students who joined us today. Well, thank you so much uh, for hosting me and for everyone for tuning in and, and especially for asking your questions, because like I said, that is, that is the fuel of science. And so uh, being curious about the world and all of the weird corners that people get to explore and how you can join in that exploration is a really exciting part of the process. So thank you for your time. All right. And anybody who's in the call, if you want to unmute your microphone, we can finish off with a big goodbye. Oh. 
uh, and then we'll <laughs> sign off for today. So go ahead. If I can see everyone's unmuting, go ahead with a big goodbye, a good, a big thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. And goodbye for making life. <laughs> Give a thumbs up again. What? Let me hear you. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Great to see everyone today. Bye. 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 Bye.